Hey everyone, welcome to this Wednesday's release of the podcast where we're talking about Bitcoin. On today's show, I bring back a fan favorite with Greg Foss, who's got more than three decades in the fixed income market, and he's joined with Cornell professor David Collum. The impetus for this conversation was a lively debate that the three of us were all having on Twitter about Bitcoin. And after we had been going back and forth on Twitter for so long, we all just kind of agreed, hey, like, let's all DM each other and let, let's set up a time to actually do a real conversation. And that's what led to this recorded interview, which was an absolute blast. You get to hear various points of view, counter arguments, and just general banter that was really a lot of fun. So I hope you guys enjoy this uh, conversation as much as I did. And with that, here's the show with Greg and Dave. I've been really looking forward to this chat, gentlemen. So welcome to the show. Hey, we're thrilled to be here, I bet. I certainly am, Dave. It's great to meet you. And uh, Preston, thanks as always for including me in your uh, podcast. We had a fun time down in Miami, Greg. Man, oh man. Um, <laughs> I will tell you, and I'm disappointed you, somehow we got crossed up, right? Because John Vallis did his uh, show. That was totally my miss. I felt terrible because I'm such a fan of him. And then to be there with you and, uh, and Jeff, I felt like such an idiot. So when I replied, it was like, uh, yeah, I'm ready. Let's, let's do this. He was like, uh, it happened yesterday, Preston. So we were on stage in Miami, but uh, the gentleman that uh, was our moderator is from Newfoundland, Canada. And that's sort of like being sort of from Saranac Lake, New York. Okay. You know what I mean? So John is down in Costa Rica and he gets on the pod and he's not wearing a shirt because it's so hot in the jungle. <laughs> all right. And a lot of people are like, John, what the heck are you doing? Are you, are you visiting us from like the men's room, the George Costanza scenario from, from Seinfeld? Anyway, point is John Vallis, great Canadian, Jeff Booth wrote the best book. I'm going to pitch this as the yes. best book I've ever read. Yes. Okay called The Price of Tomorrow. And as a Canadian, I can, I can pitch it with 100% patriotism, but also somewhat of a uh, critical bent. I love Jeff Booth. And so it was me, myself, Jeff Booth, there was Mark Yusko and Preston on stage, introduced by John Vallis and moderated by Preston's buddy, Trey. It was the highlight of my, certainly my trip to, uh, to Miami. But uh, yeah, we were trying to recreate it and we got crossed up by Preston. Yeah. I felt terrible. I got so much respect for John. Man, sometimes you just blow it. And that was me totally blowing wow. it. So Dave and I have Cornell University in, in common. Professor Dave is a uh, renowned professor at Cornell. I was at Cornell. So I'm going to date you here, Dave. I was at Cornell in 1988. Well, I graduated in 1988. So I don't believe we would have crossed paths when you were a professor. But I was an MBA student. So I was there only for two years. I was oh, at, okay. at the Johnson School and uh, certain that there's some professors. I'm really pumped because I've listened to you on, uh, you know, Marty Bent podcast. And I know you're, uh, you're certainly uh, well-versed and you speak the truth as you see it. And that's what I love. Okay. So Greg, the last time that we were talking, there was some, in my opinion, very interesting things happening in the bond market. So we had the 10-year treasury just selling off at a pace that was faster than anything we'd seen in decades. It was approaching 1.75%. What we were talking about on the show was the rate at how fast it got there. It was like instantaneous compared to other sell-offs that we've seen in the 10-year treasury. Since then, we've had a lot of news that's come out. We, I see David posting uh, Lowe's receipts today on Twitter and showing the price delta of 400% in some of these commodity prices. And everybody's talking about how the home prices are exploding. Any, any type of inflationary thing that you could think of is going berserk. But unlike what you would expect in the 10-year treasury, which is it would keep selling off and the yields would, would go any higher, we've actually seen the exact opposite, where the price has actually started to bid and now it's at 1.36. And this is only a matter of probably a quarter. So what in the world is happening? Because it doesn't, for a person who's looking at that and seeing the inflation that we're seeing, and it's not like that expectation is disappearing. Everyone's expectation moving forward is that you're going to have more of this. And so what in the world is making the bond market bid right now? What a great question. So way to jump in right into it, Preston. So here's what I know. 
That is not truth. Okay. There's a $120 billion per month purchaser elephant in the room. They have actually done a pretty magical job of getting the market short and then squeezing it. They're pretty good at trading this thing, I will admit. So everybody and their brother was shorted. It was the largest short interest by certain metrics that you've ever seen. And rumor has it, according to the Bear Traps report, that there was a one massive account that capitulated and bought it all the way down to 125. So all I'm going to throw out to you is who cares? 125 or 175, you're talking basis points. Basis points are for kids. Don't mess around with basis points. The reality is there's a $120 billion elephant in the room. That market itself is not even true. If you listen to Stan Druckenmiller, the proper rate on the US Treasury right now without the Fed being involved would be closer to 3.5% in the 10-year. And Stan Druckenmiller is way smarter than I'll ever hope to be. So let's go with his viewpoint as what the proper rate would be. The 175, 125 just so happens that 125 was a technical indicator, if I'm not mistaken, it's the 200-day moving average on, yeah. the, on the tenure. So markets always go in the direction that causes the maximum pain to the most people. And the most people were shorted, and it went from 175 back to 125. The one thing I would love to leave you with is inflation expectations are not what we need to look at right now. It's credit default. The component of the 10-year that is made up of credit risk rather than inflation risk is what the world needs to focus on right now. And I know it sounds like it's a de minimis amount in the US 10-year. Right now, the CDS market, the credit default swap market for the US Treasury is about 10 basis points in the five-year tenor. The point is this, it's going to move, it's going to get bigger, and inflation expectations are going to be overwhelmed by credit default risk. Very simply, you see it with other countries. The US will be the last market to capitulate, but you're going to see contagion that'll flow through from other countries. So we got to remove the focus on inflation expectations, whether they're real or perceived according to a CPI. And you got to focus on an open market called the credit default swap market. So that's what I would say to this. 175 versus 125 basis points in the 10-year, but that's trading levels. You got big accounts that got caught offside. It was the point of maximum pain, and all of a sudden, it's rebounded right back to 135. Again, it's noise. The range in 10 years is higher because of credit risk, but not because of inflation expectations. The Fed will control the inflation narrative. They will not be able to control the credit narrative. Stan saying that the proper rate is this 3.5% if central banks aren't involved, but they are. They are involved. Mm. And not only are they involved here in the US, but they're involved at the ECB, they're Bank of Japan over in China. So you have these major central banks that are at play. Let me run this idea past you. So I just tweeted out this picture I, that Yardini, um, I think we talked about this last time I was on, with where they plot out all the total assets of major central banks and they compare them side by side with different colors on the chart. This one was on the x-axis is time and on the y-axis it's denominated in trillions of dollars. And then it's these various colors for each central bank. On this one in particular, it does a good job of keeping the same y-axis. I don't, I don't like the ones where okay. the y-axis is different on, on each side. This one here, you can really kind of see because it redenominates all the currencies into the same US dollar currency. And it's an apples to apples comparison of how much they're adding to their balance sheet. When we look at this and we look at what's happened in the last six months, the ECB has absolutely gone bananas on the amount of printing and debasement that they've done with the euro. And so when we think about kind of the last time that Greg and I were talking, the ECB hadn't basically kicked on ludicrous speed with their uh, debasement relative to what the um, and I think this is really important relative to what the Fed was doing. They were they were kind of moving at the same pace, but ever since probably I'd say when the second quarter started of this calendar year that we're in right now, the ECB has just taken off and the Fed has has gone at a much slower pace. So this means the dollar is going to get stronger relative to the biggest 
fiat currency competitor out there, which is the Fed, right? Is that appreciation in the dollar relative to the euro, the thing that's making the treasury market kind of perform in the way that it's performed, which is it's been bidding? First, I would say one should never lose sight of the fact that all these systems look like emergent systems to me, where they can make sense right up until that moment when they don't. When LTCM went to hell in a handbasket, you've got these super, super level of correlated behavior. And it's, it's like trying to predict thunderstorms or something. It just does not make sense. Drockenmiller is an optimist, in my opinion. I've tweeted this several times. I said, imagine you had to buy a 30-year bond. I don't care about the 10, the 30. Let's use the 30. And I said, imagine you had to buy the 30, but you had to hang on to it for 30 years. And you couldn't hedge it. And you were guaranteed to be paid. But the future is a complete unknown. The one thing you had to do is say, what am I willing to accept as an interest rate for 30 years? And the collective wisdom of the uh, social media is well over 7%. And I would say that if, if I had more spaces in the, in the poll, there would have been people shooting up to 12 or 15, I think. The bottom line is I wouldn't accept 3% return on a 10-year by that model. And so I think yeah. Druckenmiller's model is not correct either. And again, he's smarter than me, but Lacey Hunt's smarter than the two of us combined potentially. And he, he would put the 10-year at 1.1 or something. And I do occasionally chat with Lacey and I, I don't push back because he's too smart. Dave, I don't buy that. I agree with you. He's really smart. He's really smart. But at the end of the day, I think the people that are participating in this market are people that aren't thinking in 30-year terms. If we had 100 of them in the room, 99 of them, maybe more than 99 of them, are not there for 30 years. They're there to put the trade on and directionally try to be on the right side of it as it bids or sells off. For 15 minutes. That's right. Or for whatever duration they're trying to, you know, time the market. So they're just speculative. So you could make the argument the entire bond market is a speculative place these days. So this is the cool thing you guys are hitting on. There's actually no such thing as capital gains in bonds, right? Everyone says I own bonds because I'm going to be the world's greatest trader and I'm going to buy it at 1.75 and sell it down to 1.25. <laughs> and the reality is it never happens because all you're doing is cashing out a coupon on your trading prowess. The greatest thing that you just mentioned, Dave, from a former bond trader is that you said you wouldn't buy it at 3% and it's currently trading at 2% in the 30 year. That 100 basis points in the 30 year is worth 20 bond points. Isn't that remarkable? 20 bond points because of duration and convexity. Yeah. And so what I love about the, the analysis that you just laid out is that you would buy it down 20%. And let's go to an extreme and say, if the 10 years at three and a half, and let's just say the five years, therefore at 5%, that's 300 basis points. It doesn't even compute. You've lost 50% of your value in a long-term treasury that's supposed to be risk-free. People haven't lived this for their entire lives. Because when I started trading, US 10 year rates were at 14% and they went down to 1% and below. So bonds are a misunderstood contract by most money managers in today's day and age. We're not boomers. You're not a boomer. That's correct. And, And the crazy thing is, even Ray Dalio, who's so brilliant on this and made so much money on a risk parity trade and risk parity hedging, he understands the bond math. He's just not calling out people on the bond math, right? He understands it for the ludicrous nature that it is. Used to be when equity sold off, bonds would get bid because interest rates would go down. But we've reached our floor in interest rates and that correlation doesn't work anymore. Ray needs another non-correlated asset. I wonder what that could be. Let's just sit back and (laughs) can understand. I want to put one more thing. You're so right, Dave, because what you have not even brought into the analysis is you lend the US Treasury 100 bucks today for 10 years. It's almost certain you're going to get your 100 bucks back in 10 years. Not 100% probability, very high probability, but you, the purchasing power of that $100 that you lent them today is going to be like $65 in today's right. dollars. If you're lucky. Years. Right. <laughs> that is why you need to hedge yourself against the certainty of fiat contract debasing. 
best thing I could advise anybody out there, do your math, understand that you should have a lower exposure to bonds than you've ever had in your career over the last 30 years. It's pure mathematics. So David, you'd mentioned Lacey. So I listened to the interview that Lacey did with Grant. He's obviously brilliant, smartest guy in the space for decades. If I was going to say the thing that I think he's missing, and I obviously want to hear you counter this, I don't think that he's accounting for there being an alternative to fiat currencies globally. His model is based on there only being fiat currencies moving forward. My model is based on this idea that that's going to, about to be disrupted. And because of that, we see the solution, we see the pricing mechanism of fixed income particularly, and equities, because I could go down how that would then fall out into equities as being grossly mispriced. But the fundamental linchpin of all this is this idea that the model that we're accustomed to over the last 30 to 40 years, ever since 71, when you come off the gold standard, that model and how we understand this homeostasis between fiat currencies is about to be disrupted. And as long as it's only fiat currencies, and as, as long as, uh-oh, the euro's printing faster than the dollar, therefore the dollar's bidding, oh no, now the Fed is printing faster than the euro. So that whole model gets flipped upside down. If there's this alien type technology that enters itself in and starts to say, no, I'm sound money. I can't be debased. I'm immediately spendable up to any amount. If you want a really high transaction, let's say you want to send $100 million somewhere, that might take 10 to 30 minutes at $5 of an expense. If you want to immediately clear, like in El Salvador, and you want to transact in dollars and receive in dollars, but use the backbone of Bitcoin, that nobody even understands how that's happening, at least from the user's perspective, it immediately clears at a $100 value. That's happening today, like right now. And so like, I'm looking at it from that lens. I don't have a problem with that view. I think that the system, what I learned as a chemist is that when you push a system away from equilibrium, way far away from equilibrium, the return trip tends to be violent, destructive, gives off a lot of heat. So in a chemistry community, you blow up your lab, avalanches, you destroy villages, earthquakes, you clip California off into the ocean, right? Any system, the return to equilibrium, which has got a, a huge pent-up potential energy is going to do destructive things. What's also true is they tend to get very shock sensitive. There was a great metaphor, analogy, aphorism, whatever you call it, by um, Richard Russell years ago when someone said, why can't this system go on forever? And his response was, go into your kid's room and start stacking blocks. He says, just keep stacking them. And what you discover is, anyone who's ever done this, is the higher the stack, the more shock sensitive. So pretty soon, Russian bond defaults can tip over the system, as we saw in the late 90s, for example. So when a system gets a shock sensitive, and I think we can all agree that the system is heading for shock sensitivity of a higher order, right? I'm not convinced we need a revolutionary technology to trigger the badness. You guys may have the solution to how to avoid that. We're about 99.9% .9 on the same page in terms of what we have to not get hurt by. We don't want to be hurt by... One of the things I learned in 2020, and I, I think the bond market is, is a sign of inflation. I once told a prominent hedge fund manager many years ago that the bond interest rates were low because of inflation. He, he totally blew me off. And now he writes about that. And it's just <laughs> that the money started chasing bonds. So the hot money went after bonds and that you say there's no capital gains, but they certainly get bid up. And the money started chasing the bonds and you could leverage up and you could buy corporate bonds and you could sort of make something on the spread and everything worked fine. By the way, I'm not as enamored with Ray Dalio as some people. A Dalio system works fine as long as you're pumping money all over the system. But his risk parity model, I think, is kind of hokey. I think it's a way to justify inordinate leverage in the bond market that he shouldn't be doing. If you want to call it risk parity, if you really want to send the bond market to the level of risk of the equity market, I think you're asking for a mushroom cloud at some point. 
And I think they've created that. We've had a 40-year bond market that's, that's been nothing but good news for 40 years. And, but now we've reached the end of the row. Now, 60-40 portfolios, you get precisely zero on your 40 almost, unless you want to go to Argentina to get a bond or something. And so your, your 60-40 is guaranteed to at best tie, at best break even on inflation on the 40. And the 60 is probably 130, 140% overvalued. And so we can agree that the conventional alternatives just suck. I completely agree with everything, especially Ray Dalio risk parity stuff where levering into the bonds, like that's nuts right now. Are they continuing to kill it because the trend for the last 40 years is still the yields going I don't down? Think it hasn't the last few years of his portfolio been uh, somewhat I think strong. that's right. I but here's the right. other thing, guys. It's only mathematics, right? Look, you can lever in a downward trending interest rate environment because in his volatility model, bonds had lower vol. If you yeah. measure risk by volatility, which isn't always the best way to measure risk, then his model sold. And that's the key, right? It was simple to understand and simple to model when he was showing it to pension allocators who bought into that model. He admits that it's no longer there. He said himself, I'd rather own a Bitcoin than a bond. Yeah. I don't or know gold. what else to say. <laughs> he supports yeah. both. He is on record both. Dalio does this macro analysis. I hope he's not listening. Why? He does this macro analysis that seems pedestrian to me. I mean, I, I listen to him. I go, oh, I don't go, what a wizard. It seems like he's just skim coding some basic principles. And I think that he, he grew his entire empire under this optimized situation that was set up by interest rates starting at 16%. And Amen he, to he, that. He, yeah, he, you're exactly right. And it's sort of like Peter Lynch became a, a rock star by entering equities in about 76 and getting out in around 2000. And sending his kids to the mall and telling him what is selling in the mall so that he could yeah, figure out. Yeah, Cinnabon, Cinnabon. You're so correct, Dave. I've never been more proud of a chemistry professor in my life, okay? Because you <laughs> want to so bond true. market, which is like yeah, you're, you're in the 99th yeah. percentile. Even the fund allocators don't understand bond markets. It's that simple. Yeah, prices guys. up, rates down. Is that well, not only that, how about this? <laughs> if something is a straight line down from top left to bottom right with no volatility, right? It's a straight line. Does that mean there's no risk? No. But that's how everyone measures risk is by yeah. the volatility. Like my Lord, people have lost their friggin' minds in terms of how to measure risk. It goes back to what you were saying earlier about pumping all the energy into something. For 40 years, they have done nothing but pump all this energy straight into the fixed income market through bidding the prices to the moon and the, the, the yields down to nothing. And Correct. here we are. You know, in the U.S., nominally the the 1.36, but you go to other parts on the planet, pretty much anywhere else on the planet, and these things are so compressed and so much energy has been stuffed into them. I mean, it's it's unimaginable, and it's just it blows my mind that you don't hear anybody talking about that systematic risk when you watch any type of financial media or news or anything. They don't get it because no one studies the bond market, Preston. You know that. Equities are the, are the thing that sells mainstream media TV. Equities are the things that grow to the moon. Equities are excitement and bonds are for mathematicians. But here's the, the, the reality. Every single fiat is debasing. That's 100% certain. It's just a relative value game. It's how fast your ice cube is melting. And if you can play beggar thy neighbor a game where the, the euro is weak compared to the US dollar, that increases exports because foreign exports and trade balances are what balances your current account. At the end of the day, it's a short-term game, but the long game, the long horizon is it's 100% certain that every single fiat currency is debasing because that's mathematics. And the relative level of debasing, well, that's just the game that they play. But they're all debasing at different rates, but they're going lower because of the math of the total debt to total GDP debt spiral. They're also not including the fact that we're going to have a tough time repeating China's influence on the last 40 years. 
So China's influence has been hugely deflationary. And so we went from you know, Maoist China, where these guys were basically half starving to death and growing rice, walking around barefoot, to generating everything the world consumes and doing so remarkably cheaply. One could argue strategically knowing that they're happy to not make a fortune because they will become a dominant superpower by just patiently selling us stuff for 40 years. These games, this is like squeezing juice out of an orange. At some point, no amount of pressure gets more. I think we could have a crack up in the bond market without the pundits will come up with an explanation. But I, again, back to the idea it's an emergent system. It could just be because the wrong vibration. It's highly likely to 99 percentile, in my opinion, that that's where it comes from. When you're in a debt spiral, debt doesn't mature. It needs to roll over. And when you have a failed bond auction, that's when people look around and say, wait a minute, maybe I'm the guy holding this hot potato. Maybe I'm the fool at the table. And everyone pulls back. And maybe and- I have 100 billion in leverage and I got to get oh, out. Listen, and then what do they do, Dave? This is what <laughs> happens because the system is so leveraged. You get a tap on the shoulder from your margin clerk and you're like, yep. hey, Foss, we're getting redeemed. We're getting redeemed. We need to deliver cash to our clients tomorrow. And I don't care what you sell, sell something because I need cash in three days right. to settle this trade. And that's the worst situation you've ever been in there in your life because you're like, I thought my portfolio was hedged, but the only thing I can really sell is the stuff that I'm long because I thought I was right about it, but I can't sell the stuff that I'm short. I can't buy it in. So this is the crazy part of how a leverage system works. And unless you've ever sat in that chair and actually manage risk on a real life basis where your margin clerk says, Fosser, you've done, you've had a great year, but God darn it, our clients are redeeming us because the world is unraveling. And sometimes we get redeemed. You know what the worst part is? You get redeemed when you're doing really well because your clients actually want to cash out of the stuff they're doing well in. And so you get penalized by the whole system because you're doing well. And all of a sudden, this leverage unwind hits contagion levels. And it always, always, always starts in the credit markets. And the equity guys still have the glue bag on and they're still sniffing that Kramer hopium (laughs) that, oh, don't sell on a Tuesday because Tuesdays are really bad days to sell. Stop it, Jim Kramer. You are giving such bad advice and you have no idea how credit markets work. It is so, so scary when I sit back having managed risk for 30 years, listening to pundits that actually have no idea how capital markets work. David, here's my question for you. I think we pretty much see the world through a very similar lens here, like all three of us. I think the, the thing that we maybe don't, I don't even know if we disagree, but I guess it goes back to my original comment with, with Lacey is, I guess, what blossoms out of this meltdown? Because everything that we're seeing leads to this event. We arrive at the event it's a total catastrophe for anybody who is, is lending money. If you're lending out dollars and you're going to get paid in dollars in the future, it's going to be one sorry store value for you to get the repayment in 30 years back at what you were lending out. So when we're talking about the size of this market, it's hundreds of trillions of dollars. Total impairment, if a new system is then stood up on the other side of this event horizon, Whatever that system is, Greg and I obviously have our bias as to what we think that is. But for you, and you're looking at this, what is that thing that's going to be restood up? Is it going to be the IMF getting everybody in the room and going back on a, a Bretton Woods kind of scenario where everyone's just going to trust central bankers and the gold that they have and then ride some currency on top of that? I don't want to say my opinion, but I think you can tell by, <laughs> by the way I'm framing it what my opinion is. Let's hear what you think. First and foremost, 2020 was eye-opening for me because I thought central banks, as nutty as they look, if you follow my Twitter feed, I don't think a day goes by that I don't tag the Federal Reserve with some insulting tweet about what a bunch of idiots are. Although I always say it in this backhanded way where I always say things like, no matter how aggressively I change them, you keep meeting my expectations. I like phrases like that. So They're full of ambiguity, but 
GameStop will soar and I'll thank the Fed and say, this could never happen without your help, right? <laughs> and uh, what makes investing so difficult now is, is that what 2020 taught me was that the sense that many of us, I think, had that there was some sort of guardrail out there is now gone. So as much as they dumped a ton of money in an 08, 09, which by the way, for the record, I called it in writing in 2002. I wrote a, about a five-page email to a friend of mine at Goldman, and I said, the banking system's going to go down, and I explained how it was going to go down, and I got absolutely everything right with one exception. I thought JP Morgan's derivatives book was going to bring it down, and I was wrong about that. And people say, oh, that's too early. And I go, when you make that kind of a call, you can be five years early. You're still dead right, right? When you call the collapse, of the, you want to call a hiccup in the equity market, you got to be on time. When you say the entire banking system is going to go down the tubes, you can be early. So what makes it so hard is that you're somehow battling an investment strategy where you have to hedge against what could be an awful inflation or a horrific deflation. And because you guys can't rule out the possibility that we get this collapse of debt, and that represents a, a massive deflationary collapse. And then all of a sudden, the things that you can own and wrap your arms around become really important. And then the question that, that you guys have strong opinions on, and I can't refute, is you think Bitcoin will still be standing. I think gold will still be standing. I think some kinds of real estate will still be standing, but I think meme stocks are gone tech stocks are gone. I, I did an analysis last year, the fangs, the, the valuations on the fangs are completely insane. You absolutely positively have to tell this miraculous story to put the valuations on these big tech stocks because Amazon is Sears Roebuck. That's all it is. It's faster, it's bigger, but it's just Sears Roebuck. Facebook is a billboard company, except for the fact that I think they get a lot of money from, from the Pentagon and sources like that. I never looked at Netflix. I thought that it was 60,000 movies. I could just pick one and watch any movie I wanted. It's like 100 upper tier channels on your, on your setup box. It's nothing. And I quickly ran out of movies that I wanted to watch. I couldn't even watch old classics. I couldn't find them. Here's a little math for you. Netflix could cut to 1% of its current value, 1%, and it would still be an overvalued company that loses money. How do you value so, a company when no matter what price it is, it's overvalued? You're naming the ones that obviously have just insane market caps. This is a huge part of the market cap, though. It's a significant portion of the S&P. All the gains, it's all the gains for the last 10 years are all embedded in about 10 of these stocks. So they go down, we got a problem. I think you got to look at the entire equity market as being equally as nuts if you normalize rates. So when I think about discount right. rates on equities, I'm thinking, well, what's the 10-year treasury? Well, we just all talked about when we started the show that Stan thinks it's 3.5. We think it's higher than that. And so let's just take a number. Let's just say it's 7% after it normalizes. And then you stick historically about 200 basis points of a premium on top of that for a discount rate in the equity market. So now we're talking about a 9% discount rate for equities, public equities. Today, we're, I think we're about 100 basis points above the 10-year treasury at 1.5. So we're like at a 2.5 current valuation. So if we move from a 2.5 to a 9% valuation in the equity market, everything, That's a problem. <laughs> everything melts down. And we're not talking like 30% meltdown. We're talking like 70, 80%. Massive. Yeah. Massive markdown if, if we go to those kind of discount rates. So like, I hear you. I agree with you. I think the whole market's looking at it and saying, well, their top line just keeps on going to the moon. So I guess that's the thing I, I need to own. And it's insane. But so, is, so are the value picks, the quote unquote value picks that are trading at a 3% discount rate when we all think that the well, real rates are, are way, way higher. You're, you're nailing it. You guys both nailed it. Remember though, that the valuation of a perpetuity is one over R minus G, okay? Mm -hmm. All equity guys play with is the G component. If you have a big enough G, you can <laughs> rationalize any discount so rate. This is so true. It's true. So it's one over R minus G is the valuation of a perpetuity. A play with the discount rate. I'm telling you, Dave, column that Netflix is growing at 12%. 
and that you can put a 15% R on that and still discount it at one over three, which is a 33 times multiple. I, I want to take it one step further. Don't even look at equities, guys. They're a derivative of the credit markets. Yeah. If the credit markets aren't working properly, equities get destroyed time and time again. You need to look at the credit markets for early warning systems in capital markets as a whole. And all of this is true. You said Sears Roebuck. So Amazon is the Sears Roebuck. Sears Roebuck used to be a Dow 30 stock and it's bankrupt. Kodak used to be in the Dow 30. It's bankrupt. It founded digital photography, but decided according to their board that there was no future in digital. Now Apple rules the digital photography landscape. Point be told, equities regularly go out of business. Credit will be the early warning system of that. And that's why you need to look to the equity markets. They, you will see the stresses in the credit markets. So Dave, I, I mean, we have maybe 15 or 20 minutes left. Let's get right to the crux of the matter. You love gold. We are on the same page 100% because of the Fiat Ponzi. All that Preston and I would love to do would be to convince you that there's no way that you can be 100% certain that Bitcoin doesn't have value. And all I would like to do is convince you to move a portion of your store of value, and it shouldn't come out of your gold portfolio. It perhaps should come out of other store of value portfolios like equity, certainly like bonds, that you need to own a portion of your portfolio in Bitcoin. Because if you are not long Bitcoin, you're exposed to an incredible short position on what could be the best performing asset of this century. And that's all I'm saying, because having traded risk for 30 years, I don't believe I've ever seen a better asymmetric return opportunity in my life than Bitcoin. And it's not because I'm 100% certain, it's only because I play the probabilities that it can go to a price that could blow the doors off of any other return asset out there. And, and I think that's what Preston and I are saying. We're on the same page. You said it, 99.9%. .9 I'm not sure if, if you own a, an allocation to Bitcoin yet, but I would love to convince you that if you own zero, you're actually taking more risk than if you own 2 to 3% of your portfolio in Bitcoin. Because if it goes to where it could go, you had 99% of the, your investment theory correct, but you didn't act on the best performing horse in the race, in our opinion. I don't want to talk for Preston, but well, in my opinion, it's the, it could be the best performing. My race. question, David, is just what are some of your reservations? Because there's people listening to this that have a very similar opinion as you, and they look at Bitcoin and they're concerned about it. So like, if, if you have some questions or things that you think just don't add up or that you think are confusing or whatever, please. First and foremost, serious investors pass on a lot of opportunities. I've had people tell me this and it sounds really good. And I go, yeah, I'm still going to pass on it. And so the ability to pass on opportunities, that it's a critical ingredient of investing. So it doesn't trouble me to pass on an opportunity. Sometimes it hurts. What are my reservations? Well, whenever I do a Bitcoin podcast, I, I do a shocking number for a guy who doesn't know his, his rear end from his hands about Bitcoin. Reservations are multifold. One is, for example, and, and you guys can address these various things. One is, I still think you're going to have to do battle with the sovereign states. And my political views are uh, such that I think that we're seeing a, a massive rise in authoritarianism. And so while Bitcoin, in my opinion, has made great progress towards, towards your goal, I also see the forces of evil amassing. And forces of evil, right? The, it's clouds over Mordor or whatever metaphor you want to use. I see more and more evidence every day that the state, capital S, will do everything to squash their opponent like a bug. And so then the question comes down to, does Bitcoin survive that? And I know there's various arguments about, you know, we're, you know, we're just distributed. I get all those arguments, but the fact of the matter is Bitcoin does have a problem if the collective Western world says we're going to squash these guys. It's not to say you're going to lose, but it is to say that you're going to be in the Battle of the Bastards, Game of Thrones style. It's what, going to be a brawl. What do you think about the Dalios and the Stan Druckenmillers who are starting to take positions in this, other politicians starting to take positions in it, and now they have a vested interest in its success? Good question. Superficially, it seems like great news. 
But what I see in these guys is I see weak hands. I see different Bitcoin hodlers. I see guys like you who look like you'll survive anything, right? You're going down with the Titanic, right? <laughs> it could be a disaster. You guys are going to be waving Bitcoin flags from the bottom of the ocean. Paul Tudor Jones apparently told Druckenmiller that, said, look, 85% of the hodlers didn't sell during that sell-off. Dude. Yeah. And, and that caught Druckenmiller's attention, right? So that's the story there. But what I know is that there are a bunch of guys out there with humongous sums of money, humongous amounts of leverage, and will buy anything, anything that's going up in price. And if Bitcoin ceases to be fun for these crazies, who I think are reckless, they're way worse than the hodlers, right? These guys will head for the hills. Not only if it stops going, they need returns or they're, they're out. And I don't know, I personally don't know how much they're influencing the market and what a wholesale sell-off by you know, hedge funds with attention spans of gnats would do. Would it destroy Bitcoin? I don't know. It would certainly knock it down some serious notches. I'm also, I'm equally annoyed when I go on Twitter and people are boasting about Bitcoin cut in half. And I go, if, if you've been following Bitcoin, that's all in a day's work. You guys have put up with so many bumps and smashes and black eyes. You guys are Conor McGregor's of the investing world. So when Bitcoin's down 60, 70, 80 percent, then we'll find out who's got who's got chutzpah. But but a factor of 50 percent, that is here's the definition of a correction. A correction is when you not only correct the price significantly, but that price change corrects investors attitudes. Now, let's go to equities for a moment. Was the two, March 2020 sell off a correction. The answer is not even close. What attitudes got changed? Two months later, they were back even. So no attitude. The attitude that would change would, couldn't possibly change. The message is just hang on, just buy more, do whatever you got to do. Was 0809 a correction? I would argue no, because the Federal Reserve came in, saved the day, and investors, again, investors' attitudes are, we're bulletproof if we just patiently. So by that model, you have to go, but you go back to 87. No, not even close. 87 was the worst example of a correction. The shot across the bow that showed people, you just weather the storm, period, no matter what, right? Brainless investing. So the last correction was 67 to 81. That one ripped the souls out of equity investors. The last correction in the bond market was so many decades ago that no one can remember. We've, we talked about that for the first 20 minutes. Everyone thinks bonds just can't go down in price. And someday that will turn out to be so wrong and so painful. So the equity investors haven't seen pain since the late 70s. The bond investors haven't seen pain since the early 80s. Gold investors are constantly sort of going up and down like a yo-yo. So they know pain. They know some pain. They, they can get pretty demoralized. And hodlers are going to have to learn to get demoralized and not sell. So that worries me. Then me at a personal level, there's still too many Wild West stories about individuals getting pounded by some, some exchange and the guys taking off the Timbuktu with the money. And I know that drives you guys nuts, but they're, they're still out there. Because it's such a Wild West, those stories are going to keep surfacing. So that's just but I would just call you guys up or call Marty Ben up and say, how do I do this safely? Yeah. That wouldn't stop me. The second thing is I hit the weak hands. I think the big money's weak hands. That's key. Right now, I think those guys who are in big could go out big fast. The sovereign state. Then there's little questions like the tether story. If you guys could explain the tether story. I, for example, look at the tether story and it looks like a compellingly problematic thing. But I personally, I'm sure if I spent hours on Google, I could answer it. But I can't tell how big a problem a tether collapse would be for the cryptos. I don't feel any better because some guy who's got laser eyes coming out of his Twitter feed tells me, <laughs> I know that you guys are having fun. I was going to put silver dollars on my eyes. <laughs> I know you guys are just having fun. But, but the fact of the matter is someone can assure me that if tether goes down the tubes, we'll be okay. And I'm going to go, well, I think at some point we're probably going to find out based on what I'm hearing might be my buying opportunity. If I'm thinking about Bitcoin, Tether goes down the tubes. By the way, I started buying energy again in the fall when they took Exxon out of the Dow. Oh 
And then I figured out the Dow only had 2% energy. And I go, so I, I've been thinking very hard about what's going to fuel the world. And it's not going to be wind turbines. It's not going to be biomass. It's not going to be solar panels. I've been paying a lot of attention to how to play energy for the next 20 or 30 years. This Dow, this 30-year treasury model. If I'm in a coma for 30 and I wake up, will energy do well? I'm trying to find the ones that I'd say they will do well. The large Dalio type entities entering the space. The thing that I think about as far as the, the really large holders of Bitcoin, they're people that were actually involved prior to 2015 and just have massive returns. And so that group, they're not selling. If anything, it's become rock yeah. solid. I get that. The, if you're going to step into the market today, I mean, the Winklevoss twins are a great example of people who have a billion plus position in Bitcoin. <laughs> and for somebody to come along today and take a position in Bitcoin and think that they're going to move it around in a negative kind of way, it's going to really take a lot. And it's probably going to have to be with borrowed coins if they're going to try to not move the market price by, now, by owning Let me the make underline. a counter to that. I would argue that Bitcoin in some sense could trade like, like a new issue, like an IPO where the float's really small. So exactly. the 85% who are solid holders, that's like a lockout period, except for it's not a lockout period. Those guys are not selling. Exactly. Get that. But the price is determined at the margin and it's got a pretty small float up there. Is that right, Greg, or not? One of you guys tell me. I think that I forget what the number was that Michael Saylor told me. His first buy was was a couple hundred million dollars. And he inserted that into the market without even moving the price. And he did it in what I want to say was a week okay. without moving right. the market price. So I think that the liquidity in the space is is actually fairly significant in order to I mean, his last buy he did, I think, was half a billion, and he put it into the market. And I don't even think you saw the price. I think the price was price. actually going down but while he Preston. inserted half a billion. Yeah, the whole market, though, it reached a trillion dollar market cap. You need to understand how large that is in terms of financial assets out there. It would have been yeah. in the top eight companies in the total global market caps of equities anywhere, not enterprise value, but equity. Dave, I love what you're saying, and I'm not going to offend you. What I want to do you is- You can't offend me. <laughs> how about this? Do you have a Bitcoin wallet then? Have you gone to the first principle? No, no, I got nothing. I got okay. nothing. Do me a favor. And with if you don't own, have a Bitcoin wallet in your possession by the end of August, I am driving over the border and I'm coming down to Cornell and I'm putting a Bitcoin wallet on your phone. And then I'm going to drive back to Canada and I'm going to send you value within 10 minutes. And you're going to be like, What? Why would I put one on when, I, when you make that offer? So I'm going to wait till August and have you come down and do it. <laughs> well, I'll do that too. But listen, this is the coolest thing. I've sent value across the world that has settled in 10 minutes. I've sent money to New Zealand indigenous tribes that have set, settled in 10 minutes. Dave, I could have you download an app right now. You could hold up the QR code over this video chat yes. we're having. Right? I've done this on the show. And I could scan it over this video chat that we're having, and I could send it to you instantly, Bitcoin, instantly. It's so beautiful, guys. And here's what I know as, a, as an engineer and conservation of energy principle and all that. Dave, no disrespect, you are overthinking the risk. They are all relative risk factors. But in the reality, think of what's happening. If I could convince you to put 3% of your portfolio into Bitcoin, and you're worried about all this stuff like Tether? Can you imagine what would happen to the rest of your portfolio, to the other 97%? I, think, I can't imagine, actually. That's what you need to. <laughs> and this is like a hedge against all that. That's I, all I'm saying. I think with Greg's, the way he's framing it is he's saying it's an expected value problem. So he's looking at what could be the payout. Let's just make up whatever that number is. If 10 trillion, sure. 50 trillion, sure. Whatever that, whatever that payout would be at the terminal value creation that Bitcoin, the network could ever be used for, let's just put that number out there. And then you look at the price that it's at today. Where are we at, Greg? A half a trillion or somewhere around 600, there? 600 billion, let's call it. Yeah. Yeah. So when we're looking at that potential payoff of where that could go, and you're thinking about it as an expected value problem, you're then saying, all right, 
I have to have some type of exposure, even if it's 0.001% of my portfolio based off of this potential upside versus downside. That I don't agree with. And the reason I don't agree with is because I'm not interested in investment that's not life-changing in some ways. And so, for example, it's the equivalent of saying, well, you should at least get a $10,000 life insurance policy. I go, why about it? So the point is for me to go into Bitcoin, for me to go into it and care enough about it and pay attention to it and do what I got to do, it has to be, first of all, I push every single major decision I ever make through one filter. And the filter is, if it goes very, very badly, will I forgive myself? Now, 3%, I could forgive myself. But for example, I would put as high a probability on a massive run in silver as I would on a Bitcoin run. So let's pull the thread on that. So when you, when you look at the market cap of silver today and what it could appreciate into saying, let's say that's a part of the new currency solution after we go through this. I'm not worried about it as a currency. I'm actually thinking about it as flat out a, a resource that's going to become hard to get. You think the demand for that is going to increase by that much? Because the market cap is already fairly mature. I think the demand is, is going to increase. I think the supply is just getting harder and harder and harder. And there's some super strong handedness in that world. There is silver being taken off, off the normal market and put in the investment market. It looks to me like it is sort of ultra strong hands, sort of like your ultra holders. And so I think the silver above ground silver supplies are getting tight. I think the investment world could push it to the point where all of a sudden you get the silver you need for your iPhones and your computers and your solar panels and you name it. Silver is in every single electronic device, every last one. So if there's a tightness in the silver market, they are going to bid it to wherever they got to bid it to. Dave, and I'll only use gold because I know the approximate supply of gold is 2% per annum, but let's play a game. If the price of gold doubled overnight, just doubled for some reason, do you think the supply would be capped at 2% per annum? Or do you think that the market would figure out a way of getting you more than 2% per annum of gold if the price doubled? Gold is different than silver. How so, sir? Gold, there are massive sovereign supplies. And Mm. gold is not consumed. The amount of gold that's been mined is still here. Silver is almost impossible to recycle with the one exception that's no longer relevant, and that's photography. So when photography was a big consumer of silver, there are phenomenal recovery rates, but it was also being used in electronics. And so people overplay the photography story. Couldn't you own Bitcoin and silver? I could. So so how about this? Look, look, here's my, so Preston wanted to play a continuous distribution. I'm going to play a binary distribution with you where I think that there's a significant chance that Bitcoin achieves more than $2 million per Bitcoin in the lifespan of my children, maybe not of me, but of my children. Okay. So $2 million of Bitcoin, would you grant me a 10% chance that that could come true if I gave you a 90% chance it was worth zero? And most people would. They'd say, yeah, Foss, you're giving me a 90% chance it's worth zero. Right. right. If I give you a chance it's worth more than 2 million bucks over a period of yeah. time. I just don't know how to put those numbers on. I will tell you how, very simply. Okay, the total global assets in the world is $900 trillion, okay? Right. If Bitcoin becomes the reserve asset of the world because energy is priced in Bitcoin, which I think is a right. very likely outcome, Is it possible that of that 900 trillion of assets in the world, Bitcoin captures 5% of 900 trillion? So 5% of 900 trillion is 45 trillion. 45 trillion divided by 21 million is over 2 million bucks of Bitcoin. So on a probability basis, if it can go to $2 million of Bitcoin and I give you a 10% chance that happens, if you give me a 90% chance the downside is zero, the expected value of that binary exactly. outcome is over $200,000 in today's dollars of Bitcoin. And it's trading right. at 30. You got to buy right. this, sir. You have to buy it with your eyes closed and then say, I own 3% of this in my portfolio. And I'm not going to worry about that 3%. I'm going to focus on the other 97%. That is the traditional, I'll play right. gold, I'll play silver, I'll play equities, I'll play Netflix, I'll play bonds. But 
Everyone overthinks it. That's all I'm saying. Everybody overthinks it. Dave, correct me if I'm wrong, but the way you responded to the, the way I framed it, you were saying that for the position size that you suspect you would take, the amount of effort that you have to expend in order to research and understand and get yourself comfortable with taking that small position size isn't worth right. it. So it's a sizing thing that's, that's limiting you today. So let's say the price goes berserk and we're over $150,000 and you're looking at this and the probability of it doing what Greg just described appears to be going higher. Is that something that you would entertain in the future as far as uh, taking it more seriously? Probably not. So I looked at Bitcoin at 10. I looked at Bitcoin at 60. There is a certain inertia that sets in when, you're, when it's up at 60,000. Still a rounding error at 60,000. <laughs> yeah, Still I, a rounding error um, when it's going to 2 million. The, the, fi- the final thing I wanted to mention was, and I kept trying to think of what it was, mm-hmm is that if you read any book on manias and panics, and I'm not saying this is a mania because I don't know, right? This is a problem. But you read any book on manias and panics and you write out a checklist, Bitcoin, you can check almost every box. So you got you know the laser-eyed crazies, right? Which yeah. I don't blame you guys for, but they're out there. And you got the retail holder saying, look, you can't lose. It can't go down. You know, If you don't own Bitcoin, you're an idiot. I chat with holders who say, yeah, there's serious risk here. I get those guys. They do the math. You guys have done the math. There is an intangible quality, albeit with a good story about the blockchain, albeit with a good story about this being distributed. All I get all that. But for example, you both have to recall how compelling the dot-com story was and how the world was changing so profoundly. Everyone and his brother was buying dot-coms and the same was true in 29. The same was true in Japan in 89. They all have. So you've got, I'm not saying it's a mania, but you got, you get to check all the boxes for mania. That is a disturbing thing. I do understand qualitatively. And I'm not sure I understand quantitatively, but I understand qualitatively because when it was, when I was looking at it at 10, it was just this goofy thing. 10 I, or 10,000. Is that, was it actually 10, 10, 10 no, bucks? 10. 10 bucks. People turn down Amazon at 12. I have people tell me, you know, so I was buying gold between 270 and 290. Now it's not the gazigabagger that, that Bitcoin is, but it was still a real good buy. And they say, well, of course you were buying it then. It was so cheap. And I go, there was about five of us who thought it was cheap back then. And the rest of them thought it was stupid. And so what I can tell you is when it was 10, it was ridiculous. When it was 60, it was still pseudo ridiculous and it's getting less ridiculous. And by the time it really looks unridiculous, it's going to be fair priced. So in some sense, I agree that it's getting less risky in the sense that it's, it's becoming more normal, right? I'll give you that. Okay. When it was 10, it was absurdity. And when now, you look at the network effect though, Dave, so here we are compared to the price when it was $10 and you look at the number of participants that were, that were on the, the network, network effect. right? The amount of participants that we're seeing that are joining the network that are using it for utility. I really think one of the biggest things that I see people misunderstand today, especially with the El Salvador announcement with it being legal tender down in El Salvador, is Bitcoin's being used not for necessarily a store of value. Like you got all these people in the US, they're buying it, they're holding it because they want the price to go higher. Down there, they're using it as a back end rail for immediate clearance. So that if you were a vendor and I was coming to you and I said, Hey, I want to pay you $10, you're saying, Yes, I want to receive the $10. And I send it to you and you look in your wallet and there's $10 in your digital wallet. And I sent you $10 from my digital wallet. A person that would see that would say, well, that was a dollar to dollar transaction, but it wasn't. It was a dollar to Bitcoin Lightning Network to dollar transaction. El Salvador, though, is a a dollar bill would buy you stuff too. This is what is happening in El Salvador right now is a dollar to Bitcoin to dollar transaction where the two users don't even know that they're using Bitcoin to immediately settle with each other. And they're using it as a network infrastructure. And that utility, when I'm thinking about the price today, and you're thinking about the utility, just like you would use metal, like you were describing silver, which I thought was, a, was an amazing point that you had there where the stock of silver 
is not like the stock of gold where it's almost like a tritting itself because of the utility that's associated with using silver. In my opinion, you have the same thing happening in the Bitcoin space where in a digital space, you are actually creating utility for the rails in order to transact and send payments fiat to fiat with Bitcoin in between because you can capture immediate clearance. The world has never had that before. Immediate clearance through a transaction so later to transmit value. One of your biggest competitors are, are other cryptos. Mm -hmm. And I know you've got the, the jump start on Bitcoin. I get the network effect. By the way, I've been thinking a lot about networking effects. And I realize networking effects are the modern day monopoly. But for example, from an outsider looking in, I have no way to know whether Ethereum is going to blow Bitcoin right out of the game. I have no way of knowing. When we think about the network effects of what I suspect is going to replace this fiat disaster that we talked about for the first 45 minutes of the conversation, I think you're moving from something that was absolute centralization to something that is absolute decentralization. So when we look at all these protocols, and there's thousands of them that are out there. For me, what it really comes down to is which one of these protocols is truly, really, truly decentralized. When I look at Ethereum, that thing is growing at a terabyte a month or a terabyte every two months. And I might be off a little bit on the rate at which that protocol is expanding. All the things, all those transactions, all the smart contracts, all the swoopy stuff that it's trying to do on the base layer. Well, guess what? That has tremendous amounts of memory associated with it. I run a full node, which is different than a mining rig. I don't know how much you know about the, the basically the infrastructure of it. So you got mining and then you got full nodes. The full node operators like myself cost me the electrical expense is so small, I don't even know what it is because it's so small. I run a full node. I run the consensus, just like Marty Bent has his full node. He runs his consensus of every transaction that ever takes place. We are the ones, people like Marty, myself, and others that run full nodes that are dictating and, and saying, this is the true code that represents Bitcoin. The reason we're able to do that and the reason why this is so important and why the Bitcoin block space is so small is because Anybody can go on the Amazon, buy a Raspberry Pi, and start running this code at such a cheap cost, $100, $200. You, could, you can use a laptop that you have just sitting there from, from five years ago, and you can run the Bitcoin full node software on it. This is what keeps Bitcoin decentralized. Back in 2017, we had miners that tried to change the code of Bitcoin to change the incentive structure to benefit them by making the block size larger. The full node operator said, that's not good for the, for the mass participants, the, the majority of participants of the network. The software got forked. It created this thing called Bitcoin Cash. It's down like 95% and maybe more than that against the real code that currently exists for Bitcoin. And, the full, and what that represented back in 2017 is full node operators dictate this decentralized code base that is immutable, can't be changed. And so if, if somebody else tries to do it in the future, the full node operators are going to stand up and they're not going to accept it because it's in our best interest to not accept it. How many the, are there? So the ones that we know that are on the network is in excess of 10,000 full node operators decentralized all over the globe. What would it take in terms of, a, let's use a modern term, an insurrection amongst the, the full node operators to somehow screw the pooch in there? What would it take to, uh, to mess with that? So when you go into a soft fork, these updates, so we just did a taproot update, which has not been fully integrated into the code base, but mm -hmm. will be here shortly. That's a soft fork. I can choose to run it or I can choose not to run it. And the soft fork means that it's interoperable with previous versions of the software. When you go into a hard fork, then anybody who forks off of that has to agree with the new code base. And, and then they've got to somehow convince other participants to go on, on that version. Is there a way for this forking to cause, can you imagine a scenario where this causes chaos, where it causes well, uh, a bit of a mess? 
So let's say that it, that it does. Let's just assume okay. that, that that could happen. The full node operators can revert back to the previous baseline of the code, and everyone's then using that. See, that used to be my concern when I first came into this is like, what if there's a bug in the code? And what if you know, it causes the whole system to melt down and crash? And then you know, the price goes to quote unquote zero. But when you start right. to understand how the soft forks happen with the code base and how the full node operators can, can agree that this is the, the code that we're operating off of, well, and right now is a perfect example. Not everybody's updated the taproot, right? Like my full node, I have. So I'm ready to right. run that whenever it's rolled out. But there's people, there's participants in the network that haven't updated to that and they're still going to, they continue to- What's the consequence? There's no consequences. They just don't get the benefits that are associated with the taproot upgrade for the node and the consensus that they're running. What's all the benefits? The Again, so it sounds like they're running Windows 95 all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. And the question is, what's the, what's the consequence? So let's say I'm running a newer version of, of Windows than Windows 95. There's more capability that's associated with the version that I'm running, but I can still send, and this is a really people that are, that are coders are going to probably cringe at some of these examples, <laughs> but I can still send you an email to your Microsoft Outlook and you're still able to receive it. So that would be the transact. <laughs> yeah. That would be see, the transaction. Windows analogy is a bad one. That's right. It's a very Microsoft bad one. Microsoft can screw up any software. <laughs> um, let me ask, do you have listeners who are not hodlers or are they all pretty much hodlers? No, I think so. You our show- it hodler or hodler? hodler? I call it hodler because see, to me, hodler means you're holding it. Your pronunciation makes more sense, but I think most people in the community would call it a hodler. Well, I'm going to call you a hodler just to annoy you. <laughs> what book should I read? Give me a book. Give me a starter book. VJ. Well, VJ. Yeah, VJ has a great book. Let me ask you this. What are you more interested in, the technology side of it, or are you more interested in... No, you're trying to convince me. I, I need you to give me a book where I get to the end. I go, holy cow, I got to get me some Bitcoin. What book? If you want to know why I think climate change is a hoax, I can give you books. <laughs> Buddy, I love it. Okay, here, I'm going to ask you to read my paper again if you didn't read it, but I put 40 pages of stuff down there. It's my history. And I'll say, Dave, I love you for doing the research. At least you're willing to be, to do the intellectual curiosity. Too many of your compatriots Stubbornly don't. Stubbornly ignorant. <laughs> no, no, no. But listen, the mark of a great risk manager is the ability to change direction and realize they may have made a mistake. So let me flip the question on its ear. It seems like you have done enough research to buy Bitcoin at a price. You just don't happen to think the current price properly reflects the potential reward. It's not the price. So I've done so many of these podcasts now. The story has changed. And that's not meant to be a criticism because, because I think the purpose of Bitcoin has changed. So I think it started out as you're going to buy pizzas with it. And I think it's turned into more of an asset class. So I don't own treasuries to buy pizzas. And if I bought Bitcoin, it wouldn't be so I could buy a pizza. Fair enough. So the or original idea of Bitcoin is I've got to use it to buy pizzas. So as an asset class, then I can entertain why the heck it would be very simple, Dave. If I can point it out from 32 years of sitting in a risk chair, it is the perfect hedge to the fiat certainty of debasing. It has no counterparty risk. It has 21 million fixed supply by math and code that cannot be overtaken or 51% attack, everything that, uh, that Preston was just referring to. It is the most perfect hard asset ever created by mankind. It's portable. It's transferable. You like gold. Well, at the end of the day, what you hold gold for in an Armageddon scenario, which I don't want to occur, but it could, you don't want to be walking around with a gold bar. Okay. You don't. You actually want to be walking around with a transferability of a seed phrase. I get that part. But you know, your pitch sounds disturbingly gold-like, except for it that It is. Part. It's exactly. But this is just gold 2.0. And I'll take it one step further. It's not actually gold 2.0. It's energy. It's digital energy. This is the most perfect conservation of energy ever created by mankind. And it has the best asymmetric return I've ever seen in a trade in my entire the life. But over to you, Preston. are coming out of your eyes. I can see the <laughs> laser beams. I had this great idea, which I wish I'd done as a 
when I was young, and that is buy some dirt cheap farmland and, and plant walnut trees. <laughs> this and, is all the same principle, but it's better because you can't pick up your farmland and move. You can't take those walls. Yeah, yeah. You, you also know, can't protect them against guys with chainsaws in the middle. Of exactly. The night. Kyle Bass has the same theory, except that he's just missing it by a fraction. He's too smart by a half. Now, when you said it's price, it's not price, though. See, let's go back to that point. It's not price. Remember when I said why I started, started dabbling in energy again? I owned energy from like 01 up to a little past where I should have, but uh-huh. it did really well. And the reason I started dabbling in energy at the end of 2020 was because I saw certain signs that told me that this thing had very little downside left and a lot of upside. One of them was the disbelief in alternative energies. Uh-huh. Second was the low representation of the S&P being an all-time record low. Exxon getting booted out of the Dow. These are all buy signals. Anyone who's yes, in sir. Wall Street says this is a buy signal. Dave, the biggest buy signal for me was when oil was negative $45 a barrel. Well, that was a problem, but, but that also <laughs> showed me that it's an emergent system that I shouldn't trust at all and get yeah. the hell out of Dodge and go to Montana. But I think what would get me to buy Bitcoin more likely would be, would be a combination of price, which would come from what I still believe will be a brawl. I think you guys, you guys haven't yet squared off against the state. But are you 100% right? certain that's an actual outcome? What if that isn't? No, the I'm not. Well, I'm not. I think we're going through that right now. I think we're going through it in a major way. So, China had half the mining processing power for the entire network. China banned it 100%, just stepped in, banned Bitcoin, had forced all of those miners to turn off every one of their rigs and to get them out of the country. And that's they're good trying news, to not bad news. So for us, you're right. This is good news. You're saying banning mining. I think when the Western powers say it's illegal to you, I think when the Western powers go at you, that's when we're that's when we're going to be looking at the battlefield and say, OK, who won? Let me play the optimist from Canada. There are smart people in politics that would realize this is a chance to absolutely change the world. And right now it's it's starting in Central America. We better learn Spanish if we don't get our uh, act together, okay, guys? Get a Western nation that's in the G7 to embrace this, and all of a sudden, you've totally changed the narrative of East versus West. The thing I would tell you, Dave, is I think that the, the game theory is, is maybe something that you're discounting a little too much. Yeah, or I'm overcounting. When I think of the game theory and how it's played out, it starts out with the individual. That's what we've seen. Then it started moving to the corporations. A lot of people in the space have been predicting very early on that you're going to see local governments start to do it. Then you're going to start to see state governments that are going to start doing these policies that are actually the opposite of banning, and they're actually going to try to start pulling it into their domestic regions. We're seeing that play out right now. We've seen it. Look at Miami. Look at the, the person who's the front runner in New York. Look at what's happening in Texas. Look at what's happening in Wyoming. This, these are all this, locations that I don't know what's happening in all these locations. So well, yeah, I know it happened in El Salvador. Now you're um, having small nation states that are adopting it as legal tender. So in order for Bitcoin to fail, in my opinion, you have to have all of them collectively ban it. If there's even a couple nation states that allow it, I think Bitcoin's going to continue to do quite well. I wanted to answer your question about the the books. Two books that I think are really important reads. The Bitcoin Standard, in my opinion, is a great book, especially because it addresses things from a very economic lens. The other book that I would tell you that a lot of people in the community don't talk about, but for me was really instrumental in my understanding, is this book right here. It's called The Book of Satoshi by uh, Phil Champagne. And what he did is he went back through all of the forum posts when Satoshi was designing Bitcoin. And these are all the things that he described. And, and, and a lot of your questions were questions that people were asking him or her or whoever 10 years ago, uh, more than 10 years ago, in many cases, like, how does the mining work? How does this work? And he or she goes through all of these questions in excruciating detail, describing the inner workings of what this person or entity created. 
And I've just found this book to be uh, a gem of a resource to really kind of understand the intentions behind what was created. You were you were also talking a little bit earlier about like it being a store of value versus th- there's many different meanings as to what this thing is and and what it was intended mm-hmm. to be. What I would tell you is the block times of 10 minute blocks pose this initially when it was created posed this issue of you know I'm not going to go to a Starbucks and use this and then stand there for 10 to 20 minutes for the transaction to clear as I'm waiting to leave the store that will never amount to a something that will compete with a currency but or that seems solvable to me anyways and it is solvable and it's already solved and it's solved in a second layer so just like how the internet has the internet protocol at its base layer and then you have the transmission TCP Transmission control protocol that rides on top of it that breaks the data packets into smaller pieces. Well, I also have a credit card. It means I don't have to have the money in my wallet. I presume that you could have intermediaries that act as the go between that says, give them the coffee, we'll cover it. And so that's what the layer two lightning network, which is already in place and already works. So the way I would describe it in a really easy, understandable way is on the base layer, on the, on the base Bitcoin layer, it's like Fedwire. It only takes 10 minutes to 20 minutes to clear opposed to four to five hours to a day when you use Fedwire to, to pay for your house. So that's on the base layer. Right. Then on the second layer, which is the Lightning Network, this is like ACH. This is like your immediate clearing that takes place when you swipe your, your credit card with a store, only it is immediate. We know in the background when you swipe your credit card that there's these IOUs that then clear Mm -hmm. um, at a much slower pace, but with the Lightning Network, it happens immediately. Credit card companies basically are paid to take the short-term risk. What you're finding is now, and so here, this goes to the game theory too. So I want to say it was like nine months ago, there was some legal changes that they clearing houses can now use quote unquote cryptocurrencies bitcoin lightning network in order to use it for clearance rails well why are they doing that well they're incentivized to use this because the first movers that are able to do this are dropping their expense structure of this rube goldberg machine of clearing down to nothing right so now if i'm visa and i'm using this in the back end rails like think about how much money I'm saving myself because I can get immediate clearance by using lightning channels. And so we're, there's a company called Fold. They've got a Visa card. So like I, when I go out and buy something with my debit card, it's just a Visa debit card. I get Bitcoin for every single transaction as a reward, like an air mile for every single transaction I conduct on a daily basis today, right now. And they're using the lightning network. So who pays the, the money to Visa? Where does that money come from? Does that come from the, the vendor? It's coming from the vendor today. Now, the, this company, when I say they're using the Lightning Network, I probably need to be a little bit more clear with what I'm saying. So they also have a rewards card system. So like if, if I wanted to buy a $100 gift card on Amazon, I can buy that $100 gift card with Bitcoin, and then they're using those for some of the rewards that they're then paying people that are using their Visa card. And it's kind of like this this business model that kind of interconnects some of those things. But there's people out there today, like myself, every single transaction that I conduct, I get Bitcoin rewards just like their air miles. For Greg, if we have a correction, column style, an attitude adjusting correction, do you think Bitcoin follows that Part way, gold certainly will. Oh, 100%. You think bit- oh, yes. Okay. And it, it could be the buying opportunity of the century, but I always go through life as saying, well, what if it doesn't happen? And then you're waiting for a pullback to 25,000 or 10,000 when in fact you think the upside is 2 million, you're getting too fancy by a half, right? Here's the real use model that I know. When Preston and I were in Miami, I met a bunch of kids from Guatemala. They were starting a Bitcoin exchange in Guatemala that wanted to be based on the same concept they used in El Salvador. And we happened to be on stage about six hours before Jack Mahler's got on stage and announced he had onboarded the country of El Salvador. Okay. And I'm talking about these young kids that are trying to do something in Guatemala because 
we think of things through the lens of a privileged G7 country, in my case, and a privileged G1 country, in your case, about trying to time markets and everything. When If you took yourself to the other 180 fiat currencies in the world that are not privileged like our own, they look at things through a much different lens. Argentina is a serial defaulter that's defaulted three times in my lifetime. They think like of things a whole lot differently. Years, right. These years. kids from Guatemala are going to change the world for Guatemala. And it may not register in Canada, and it certainly won't register in the US if it doesn't register in Canada. But let me tell you, over time, they could be changing their entire susceptibility to fiat imperialism. And that is a beautiful thing from my perspective, okay? Look, I'll just tell you, the world deserves to be given an equal chance. And these kids are so smart. Lots of them were schooled in the US and decided to go back to their home country to try and make a difference. And all of a sudden, they weren't experts just in Guatemala. Guatemala is a three-hour car drive from El Salvador. These guys are the most popular kids on the block right now to try and help all the implementations that are taking the place. Block, I get it. On the block, it's so I cool. That. All I would say is a 57 year old old fart like I am. It gives me yeah. such confidence to see this in innovation and aspiration in the eyes of young kids. And I know you'd feel the same way. So I'm going to send you money on a Bitcoin wallet and you're not allowed to keep it. You're just going to transfer it to Guatemala. Okay. So it's going to go from FOSS to Column to Guatemala. And you're going to say, I should have probably kept this thing, but I, I sent it to Guatemala just to pay it forward, to pay the, the beauty of this system forward to people whose lives literally will change if you give them 500 bucks versus you and me who, you know, if you checked your seat cushion right now, you wouldn't just find 500 bucks. You'd find a lot more money than that in your couch at home, right, Dave? We are a very privileged country that doesn't see things the same way as, as these. And that's what Bitcoin is for a lot of people. It's hope and it's truth, and it's math and code. And that's what I've lived my whole life on, is math and code. I believe that you have to marry an investment. They always say, don't marry an investment. I believe you have to marry an investment. You can trade anything, but you have okay. to marry an investment. And so I, I guess I'm looking for that, that marryable moment. Here's a related story. It kind of conveys the epiphany I'm looking for personally, where a friend of mine named Steve Sanofsky was Gates' right-hand man. He became president of Microsoft, but he was a Cornell undergrad, and I knew him then. And Gates had taken the internet too lightly, and he was not taking it seriously at all. And Sanofsky comes to Cornell for a reunion, and he emails Bill and says, Bill, all of Cornell is wired. And that supposedly is the moment that Gates said, holy cow, we've got to get there. The moment may come, right? I have to do some more reading. Greg, you of all people, because I know you know the fixed income world. There's a lot of hodlers out there. Notice I'm calling them hodlers now. So I'm, <laughs> I've boy. already changed. There's progress. Our mission, our mission is um, done. <laughs> there's a lot. Exactly. We can quit now. A lot of hodlers do not know history. They don't know market history. They don't know manias, panics, crashes. They don't know any of that. Those guys are of no value to me in my quest to understand this stuff. So I, there's only, so Mark Yusko matters to me, but he, he goes, him and Pomp and these guys go all glazed eyed, Raul Paul. And I get nervous when I see them looking glassy eyed. And I don't mean laser eyed, glassy eyed, enthusiastic. I go, the enthusiasm level has got me spooked. I want these guys looking nervous. I want, I, I want to see some fear. I put kids through college buying tobacco at this exactly oh, yeah. the right time. Oh, yeah. And I was nervous. And I finally had that moment where I said, my God, here's the, here's the final piece of the puzzle right here. And I put it together and I bought more than I should have. And I put kids through college with it. You and, sound like and, a way better and, trader than anybody on Wall Street. Let no, alone, but it, I still own it. I mean, let, I still let alone a, a chemistry professor. OK, so all I'm going to say is I'm going to help you sign off, Preston, because I think we've accomplished <laughs> one thing. OK, he's doing more Hard research. Work. He's Hard doing work. more research, which is all I could ask of anybody, because I know people who are intellectually lazy that we don't have room for them, but people that will research it and do the work that's required and still discount it or say it's not for me. Hey, all I can say is thank you for trying the research and 
hearing the arguments. Right. So, and- Dave, I, I have a, I approach investing in a very similar way that you're kind of describing where if I don't have the conviction in the trade, I just won't put it on. Even, even if, you know, like Greg's right. throwing out the numbers. And for me, I just have to read. Like I just got to pick up a bunch of books, go to the the best sources I can find. Really, for me, it's books because I can have these conversations with people, but I don't know what their biases are. I don't know if they're only understanding ten percent of the overall site picture or whatever. But if I read a couple books that are from notable authors that are big names in the space, it has a huge impact on me to just build whatever conviction I might need for the trade. If I don't have conviction in the trade, I've usually been burnt by selling it at the wrong time and buying it at the wrong time. So I just want to tell you, I appreciate the conversation and I appreciate you approaching it in such a, we're going to have over a hundred thousand people that are going to listen to this conversation. And like, that's a, that's a massive amount of people that you're just willing to put so you yourself guys are out there screw for up my Twitter feed off more no, than not, you already have. No, not at all. You guys have already wiped it out with the laser crazies. The other problem in my defense is I cover too many topics. So I write about college politics. I write about Las Vegas shootings. I write about, I write about all fixed income and equities and all sorts of stuff and, and anything that moves me. And so, so for a topic to fight its way into my field of view takes some serious effort. All right, guys. Well, this was a blast. I'm going to have links in the show notes to both of your Twitter feeds. We'll also have some links to the books that were mentioned throughout the show. Uh, We'll also have Greg's article in there. And uh, with that, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks again, guys. Have a great night. Yeah, Thank you. This was fun. Hey, so I hope everybody enjoyed this chat with Dave and Greg. One of the things that we kind of got sidetracked on during the conversation that was never properly addressed was Dave's comment or question about Tether and stable coins in general. I think this is a super important topic that's currently taking place right now with respect to policy and regulatory guidance that's coming out like as this is being released. Just recently in this past week, I've listened to two different interviews with a person who I respect immensely, who I think is probably one of the most eloquent speakers in the space on this, and that's Miss Caitlin Long. Recently, she did an interview on Stefan Levera's podcast and also a podcast with Georgetown professor, Dr. Chris Brummer. Uh, I'm going to have links to both of these interviews in the show notes, and I hope you guys take the time to check these out because I think they're definitely worth your time. And I think it goes into way more detail than we would have ever covered in this conversation that addresses this specific concern, this uh, specific topic. And so I just really encourage folks to check out those, those two interviews, which we'll have links to in the show notes. If you guys enjoyed this conversation, be sure to follow or subscribe to the show on whatever podcast application you use. Just search for We Study Billionaires and the Bitcoin specific shows come out every Wednesday. And I'd love to have you as a regular listener. Um, If you enjoyed the show or you learned something new or you found it valuable, if you can leave a review, we would really appreciate that. And it's something that helps uh, others find the interview in the search algorithm. So uh, anything you can do to help out with a review, we would just greatly appreciate. And with that, thanks for listening and I'll catch you again next week. Thank you for listening to TIP. To access our show notes, courses or forums, go to theinvestorspodcast.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decisions, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by the Investors Podcast Network. Written permissions must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below. 